Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joan Woodward, president of the Travelers Institute, the public policy division and educational arm of Travelers. Welcome to Wednesdays with Woodward, a webinar series we developed where we convene leading experts for conversations about today's biggest challenges, both professional and personal. So before we get started, I'd like to share our disclaimer about today's webinar. And a big thanks to our partners today, Trusted Choice, SIAA, APCIA, Metro Hartford Alliance, the Masters in FinTech program at the University of Connecticut School of Business. So today we're gonna to talk about the evolving personal insurance marketplace. From supply chain disruptions, increasing inflation to changing customer and employee expectations, the auto and home insurance industries are rapidly changing and you can see it every day in your business. It's imperative that insurance carriers and agents alike adapt and quickly. Joining us today are two travelers personal insurance leaders. We'll provide insights into how carriers like us and agents like you can successfully adapt to these changes and to partner to take advantage of significant opportunities that we see uh, because of these changing conditions. So first up, we're gonna hear from Bill Zielinski. Bill is our Senior Vice President of Product Management and Analytics for personal insurance at Travelers. Bill joined Travelers in 2010 and today is responsible for day-to-day -day profit and growth, managing national underwriting and product management across all PI product lines. Bill is stepping in for Michael Klein who had an unavoidable last minute schedule change. So Bill, thank you for jumping in today. Um, and then next up, we're gonna hear from Lori Tademan. She's the Senior Vice President of Personal Insurance Field Sales at Travelers. So Lori oversees eight regional sales teams and supports 13,000 independent agents. She brings 20 years of experience in field sales management and another 10 in direct agency experience. So these two leaders really are at the top of their game at Travelers in the personal lines uh, business. And they see every single day how they can help you. And we're really excited to hear from them. So Bill, the virtual floor is yours. Excellent, thank you, Joan. Really excited to be here. So with that, let's jump right into it and begin with an overview of the personal insurance industry performance. To get everybody acclimated to the slide, the blue bars that you see represent written premium and the red line that you see represents uh, combined ratio, which is a standard industry measure for profitability. If I draw your attention all the way to the right-hand side, you'll see that $377.7 billion was the size of the personal insurance marketplace in 2021. Pretty healthy size, representing about half or actually a little bit more than half of the total property and casualty market. And over a five-year period, that represents a 4.4% compound annual growth. Now, turning our attention to the red line combined ratio, the results have been a little bit more modeled. So you can see over a 10-year average, we averaged a, a 101 as an industry meaning we paid out one more dollar than every hundred we took in in premium. Now, 2018, 2019, and 2020 were very profitable years uh, for the industry with 2020 being influenced pretty significantly by the pandemic, which resulted in lower auto losses. The number that jumps out of the page perhaps is that 105 combined ratio in 2021. And we're certainly gonna spend some time on that in a minute, but before we do, you know, from a traveler's perspective, uh, in 2021, we ended with $12.5 billion in written premium. That's up 10% year over year and ended with a combined ratio of 97. So by both measures of uh, scale, production, and profitability, uh, we outperformed the industry. And to put a finer point on that, uh, we outperformed the industry from a profitability standpoint nine out of the last 10 years. Now, as we look forward, and uh, drive into that 105 for 2021. We'll take a look in a second at, the, uh, at what's driving that underneath. So next slide, please. So as we all know, you, can, you, you probably have experienced it personally, cars are returning to the road. And as cars are returning to the road, unfortunately, accidents are coming with them. Uh, as, as an industry, I think the term that's most frequently uh, referenced is a return to normal accident frequency um, is, is what we're feeling. Now that is being compounded 
by raising inflation, which is driving severity, which is the cost uh, for each accident. Uh, what you have here is a couple of key metrics. We'll start in the top left. Uh, for those of you who have recently bought or sold a used car, you have probably felt this. There's been a 38% increase in the price of used cars since 2019. When you look to the right of that, new car inventory has dropped nearly 90% in that same time period. So still demand for cars, no, lower new car inventory, pushing up prices in the used car market. The bottom left, bodywork CPI, and think of that as parts and labor for repairs. That's up 12% in 2021 alone. And then finally, bottom right, medical care services. Think of this as a large component of the liability losses in auto. Costs are up 9.5% over the last two years. So again, the industry is seeing elevation across the board from a severity standpoint. So that's the reality that we're seeing in the auto market. And as we look at property, property is not immune to those inflationary drivers. Many of the same dynamics come into play across labor and materials. In addition, weather continues to be a really big part of the property story. Uh, yes, weather leads to volatility, meaning uh, more or less weather in a given year. But in more recent years, we've seen a consistent elevation and loss. Uh, this is a view of 2021. What we plotted here are the 20 separate $1 billion loss weather events that occurred in 21. You can see on the left-hand side, wildfire in the West. You have hurricanes in the Gulf Coast, uh, tornadoes, uh, severe weather uh, in, the, in the central part of the country. So pretty significant weather. Now there are some white spaces there, but that doesn't mean that weather wasn't happening. It just happened at a scale that was below a $1 billion loss. There are actually 50 other weather events that were tracked. Um, in total, the industry lost $75 billion through weather events in 2021. Very significant and, and basically on par with the prior year. So for many of us deep in the industry, we know this story pretty well. But as we move forward, we felt it was very important for our customers uh, to understand that as well. So if we take a look at the next slide, you know, we, we feel a real responsibility and a value, quite honestly, to providing our agents with the tools and our customers with the education to understand what's happening in the market. And here you can see two infographics that we put together, one for property and one for auto that attempt to succinctly convey the drivers of those increased costs that we're seeing. Both visuals are really designed to give you a quick view of the pressures in both of those lines. The feedback that we're getting is these are very helpful resources. Our agent partners talk to customers about premium increases and as our customers get the renewals. So yes, it is about education, uh, but we also see this as a moment uh, to resell versus remarket. Thank you to Lori for that. The dynamics that we see are environmental, meaning it's not specific to one company. In addition to that education, we think offering coverage reviews, right? Making sure that customers are adequately protected in these unprecedented conditions are really important. Making sure that there's a right coverage from an auto and a property standpoint. And otherwise, we call this really providing total account solutions. It's about having the right protection for customers, which also can help you to take advantage of multi-policy discounts. So moving forward, you know, the industry and we as travelers are responding to loss cost pressures. But in addition, we're really focused on building capability. After all, building capability is how you generate sustainable competitive advantages. And to us, telematics and digital are really core parts of how we position ourselves for today and tomorrow. So with that, let's jump into telematics. So I, I, I'll start with, I think we all have our personal preferences, beliefs, maybe even hypotheses around certain things, but nothing is more clarifying than understanding customer needs than talking to your customers directly. <laughs> we feel this is extremely important and this is really where we started our journey from a telematics standpoint. So what did we learn? Well, first, the interest in telematics is broad-based. That top graphic, nine out of 10 drivers have an interest in paying premium based on how far and how well they drive. So broad-based interest is point number one. Point number two, 
there are some differences around preferences underneath that. So from a monitoring standpoint, when uh, customers think about understanding how well do I drive, four out of 10 will say you can monitor it all the time. Another four out of 10 will say a brief period, please. So a little difference of opinion there. Now, once you get further into that, how is the driving monitored? Five out of 10 would prefer that monitoring to occur through the car, be it software, be it a device. Another four out of 10 would say mobile device. So these were really important inputs to help shape our approach. In addition, uh, it's really valuable to understand where the fleet is, right? Cars from a capability standpoint. And one very uh, uh, salient data point is that in 2023, it's estimated that one out of every three cars on the road will be telematics ready, meaning they will be collecting information about driving, about the environment, and be able to share that. So with that, let's jump into what we've seen today. So since we launched IntelliDrive Mobile in May of 2017, we've seen just an incredible uptake. So the adoption, so the number of new customers who subscribe to the telematics program has improved by nearly 50%. And we think that tells us that our offering is resonating. It is adding value to our customers and our distribution partners feel the same way. So really just incredible results, but we're not satisfied. So as we look forward to our roadmap, it's really all about enabling that customer choice of how customers want to engage with telematics. So again, in 2017, we initially launched our IntelliDrive mobile app, and then we had a major refresh in 2020, where we really significantly improved the experience within the mobile app which put us uh, at a 4.5 rating in the Apple Store. We added distraction and we increased the sign-up discount, creating momentum. Next, we released digital auto discount, which coupled IntelliDrive with paperless and self-service options that we have for a bigger discount for customers, again, increasing interest. And we also began a pilot for IntelliDrive Plus which is our continuous monitoring offering. If you remember just from a second ago, four out of 10 really prefer that continuous monitoring from a customer standpoint. And then we're really excited that later this year, we'll be experimenting or piloting with a new co connected car offering to get that data directly from the car. Again, think five out of 10 would prefer that. And that'll allow us to get that experience from a, from a driving standpoint directly at point of sale. So we're, we're super excited about the opportunities we have in front of us from a telematics roadmap standpoint. Now, all that said, of course, property insurance is a really important part of the PI landscape and in particular for travelers. So if we move forward in property, we're really focused on two things. One, resilience and two, risk evaluation. And here we have a couple of vignettes to show that for you. From a resilience standpoint, we are actively working with the Fortify program, which is partner in partnership with IBHS, to better understand construction methods and standards so that homes can stand up better to weather, right? It's all about resiliency. Hurricane wind mitigation in the South was a real big initial focal point. And I think as an organization, as a group, We'll start to turn our attention to other places, perhaps like California, uh, with wildfire to help shape regulation codes, understand materials, defensible space, et cetera. Top right, wildfire defense systems. We've contracted with WDS in California and Colorado to protect homes at risk during wildfires, which we know is so very important. And we've seen a lot of success in that program already. The bottom two examples that I'd like to call out relate to risk evaluation. We have a partnership with Hover where we give customers the option to do self-inspections, external self-inspections of their home when purchasing a new policy and provide similar capability for our insureds during the claim process. And then finally, one that we're really excited about is uh, the ability to leverage aerial imagery in combination with artificial intelligence to get better insights into the home for those of you who have recently purchased a homeowner's policy, sometimes maybe it feels like the questions insurers ask can feel a little obtuse. You're not sure exactly how to answer it. 
Uh, do I have a hip roof or not? Uh, these questions are often just proxies for the real risk factors. How big is your roof? Are there trees around? What's the condition? When you think about aerial imagery in combination with artificial intelligence, we'll be able to get to the ground, ground truth of some of those risk characteristics and do that with less customer effort. So hopefully that gives you good context on the PI industry trends and travelers response. With that, I'm really happy to pass it over to my partner, Lori Tateman, to talk about the independent agent channel and really what we're learning from consumers. Great, thanks so much, Bill. Really appreciate the overview on the industry, the pressures that we're experiencing in lost costs on both auto and home, and quite frankly, what Travelers is out there doing about it. So I'm gonna jump into a little bit deeper dive on the independent agency channel. And I wanted to start with the view of market share. It's a little bit different than what Bill was showing you. Uh, I guess a little bit of a spoiler alert here, I'll tell you, the independent agency channel is doing really, really well right now. Uh, although we see strength right now, we do believe there's opportunities to continue to evolve. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. But if you look at the total industry here, we break down market share by the captive agency channel, the independent agency channel, and the direct to consumer. So if you look at this across from 2016 on the left side, 2021 in the middle to an estimate of where we think market share will lie in 2023, I'm gonna take you right to the middle where the dotted red line is. Uh, so the great news is for the first time ever, the independent agency channel has more market share than any other channel. As you can see at the end of 2021, the captives have continued to decline in market share with only 35.3% share and projected to continue to lose share the independent agency channel has been pretty steady with slight gains year after year after year. And I'll dive down in a, a second about how that looks different in auto and home. And then as you can see, the direct channel has continued to grow really on the backs of their automobile growth. Um, and again, looking to be about 30% by the end of 2023. So if I, if I break this down by auto, what you'll see is the continued decline of the captives, a much steeper incline for the direct-to-consumer, they picked up a lot of share, uh, actually surpassed the independent agency channel in 2018 with more market share in the direct-to-consumer than in the independent agency channel. But if you flip it and you look at the property marketplace, again, you see the continuous decline of the captives. Direct has actually struggled a little bit on the property side with less than 20% of the market share, while the independent agency channel's really been the recipient of all that market share gain. And I think a lot of that has to do with the rising premiums. You know, people certainly want to turn to a trusted advisor to understand how to ensure their greatest asset in life. So all in all, feel really, really strong about where the market share lies. We think independent agents are going to continue to grow it and we'll work with you to help evolve and make sure that that continues to happen. So moving forward, I thought I'd break down a little bit about the market dynamics. Again, you know, re it reiterating that the independent agency channel is thriving. If you think back to the early days when the independent agency channel was formed, it was the first choice model. And I'd, uh, I'd have a pretty strong argument that it still is the choice model. I think uh, both customers and carriers alike see it as a terrific way for the consumer to get to a company and actually get choice. So as I take you across this slide from left to right, not only are we seeing mergers and acquisitions, but we're seeing independent agents actually invest in themselves. You can see mergers and acquisitions were up 30% in 2021. So again, uh, I think folks see the, the investment of staying in the independent agency channel and getting even larger. From a big brand standpoint, you can see all states investment in an independent agency company and national general, Liberty, continues to make investments in independent agency companies with their latest acquisition of State Auto, Farmers, acquisition of MetLife, and State Farm for the first time in the history of State Farm, they actually made a very small acquisition of a non-standard auto company in Gaines Co. So again, I think the big brands are seeing the value in having an independent agency distribution channel. When you look at adjacent ecosystems, we're seeing a lot of our larger agencies, those that have significant auto flow, those that have flow from real estate relationships, they're embedding themselves in the actual buying process. So whether you're buying a home or a new vehicle, 
some of our largest partners now are embedding themselves. So at the time of sale, you can actually right then and there buy your insurance as well. When you look at InsureTex, you know, more evidence that the independent agency channel is thriving as InsureTex with their ease of doing business and their flexibility with technology, you know, they came on the front and then quickly realized that they, they'd hit their headroom, that they needed to have the expertise and distribution that the independent agency channel brings to them. And then lastly, just like we saw on the far left, we've seen mergers and acquisitions within the agency management system world. Uh, we're really down to a couple significant players that are out there investing in real-time capabilities for independent agents to sell insurance. So moving forward, I'll take you a little bit through what we're seeing with customers. So the consumer today, as many of us know, as we are all consumers ourselves, we're really seeing some dramatic changes in how businesses continue to do business, yet how consumers pre pre prefer to do business. So if I take you to the left-hand side, you'll see today that 91% of consumers want to engage using text. Regardless of what it is, they wanna be able to text whenever they wanna buy something or learn something. 90% of consumers out there today trust online reviews as much as they trust a personal recommendation. And I tell you, I'm no different. Whenever I go to buy something, whether it's uh, a new car, whether it's something I wanna purchase for the house, the first thing I'm gonna do is go to somebody's website. I'm gonna look at what kind of reviews they've had and understand if that's something I wanna pursue. It's not any different with insurance. People still wanna understand if this is an agency or a company that others have recommended. 60% of consumers believe that future shopping is going to incorporate both the human and digital aspect which I think sets up awesome for independent agents because you guys are that trusted advisor. You are that human contact they want. They just wanna do a lot of work digitally. And then when they have questions or concerns, they wanna be able to talk to someone that can help them through the process. And then lastly, 60% of consumers, transactions last year were online compared to just 42% one year earlier. So you can see this, uh, this number just jumping almost exponentially right now. We, we just can't not understand that consumers are gonna do business online, regardless of what it is they're purchasing. So again, as I talked about businesses and consumers, you know, most businesses are still trying to do business face-to-face -face with mail, with phone calls, with email, and customers are pretty, you know, pretty predominantly saying that, hey, we don't need to talk to people all the time. We really prefer the text, we prefer social SMSs, and we like videos and video chats. So just a, just a reminder that as we evolve and we think about how consumers want to do business, this is going to be important for all of us to consider how our businesses look today. So moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about helping agents get future ready. Um, not only agents, but carriers. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how we need to be future ready, as a lot of our competitors have as well. And one of the things we did was we came up with a future ready assessment. And thanks to all of our agents that have taken that, we've really received some incredibly valuable input. And quite frankly, we really listen to our agents to help us shape the investments we're gonna make moving forward because what you need to be successful is only gonna help us be successful. So partnering together to make sure we're future ready is really, really important. It's a great survey. If, uh, if you don't have it, we'd be happy to share it with you. I think it's a great check within the agency, not only at the top, but throughout all the employees within an agency to understand how everyone evaluates your future readiness. What I really like about it is we can score your success in becoming future ready and whether you're an agency just starting in the business and you don't know how to get future ready, we got some great tips. Or if you're a very sophisticated agency at the other end, we think we can bring home a couple more ideas that only continue to help you be more and more future ready and meet the expectations of the customer. So moving forward, I want to talk a little bit about some of our learnings that you have shared with us that really, again, are helping us think about how we're going to invest in your future readiness. If I take you from left to right, we found it really interesting that 36% of agents don't use any carrier digital marketing tools. Uh, not, not necessarily a, a publication for travelers, but I think many of your carriers, we just happen to think ours is the best in the business in Toolkit Plus, you know, you should leverage anything you can. Uh, fortunately, our Toolkit Plus program's really been uh, well-received by our agents. It's driven better results within uh, 
quoting and actually getting an issuance. So we're really excited about what Toolkit Plus brings to our agents, not only from the standpoint of now having mobile capabilities, but being able to share metrics with you and even tighter security that I know is on everybody's mind today. Another thing we learned from the survey is 36% of agents haven't claimed their Google listing and don't show up in a top five search. Now, I just talked about how when most people go to buy something, the first thing they're going to do is try to get to you through your Google listing, and then they want to know what others are thinking about you. So uh, really, really important to claim this Google listing. This was a capability we didn't have at Travelers, and instead of actually building it, we said, we need to find a partner, and we found a great partner in Podium that provides not only how you can grab your reviews, but how to claim your Google listing and how to make sure you have texting capabilities going back to what the consumer is looking for, that texting capability back and forth with you. Next, we found it interesting that nearly 40% of agents don't provide immediate business quotes. You know, th this would absolutely be a disaster long term if we can't provide immediate quotes because a consumer can go online and immediately get a quote. So we have to make sure that you have capabilities to compete against those direct-to-consumer companies, those online companies, by providing that immediate quote. So we developed a digital quote proposal where literally everyone in your office can text to the consumer right then and there after you've talked to them, text them a quote. What we find with this, in addition to not only being able to provide that immediate quote, we also see that they begin asking questions about other lines of business they may want to ensure with you. We actually see them take up more coverage when they begin to do some of the educational pieces within the digital quote proposal. So that's really been a hit and something I highly recommend uh, all agents make sure they have the capabilities to do. And then lastly, 40% of agents, nearly 40% don't offer any extended or after hour service. And I think everyone realizes that we're living in a 24 by seven world and having the capabilities to work with that consumer whenever they want to is really going to drive their loyalty to, to you. So we've invested in our customer care center. I know some agencies have invested in their own customer support systems, but we're really excited about ours because not only does it provide that service during the day when you may need additional help, it provides the after hour services as well to make sure your customer can get to you anytime and we do all the servicing for you. So just one last uh, thing that really came up that we really found we needed to continue to invest in. So as we think about the future, just want to put up a lot of different things I think both carriers and agencies alike should be thinking about. You know, the first one is the self-service. We just happened to show a picture of our mobile app, but self-service is key. Every, uh, every consumer out there, and I'm one of them, I have a great independent agent, but there are things I can do that I don't need to bother my agent on. I need my agent for... Those, those important questions to help me better understand insurance needs versus just making a bill payment or changing a mortgagee. Uh, virtual inspections, we know we have to continue to invest in that. Consumers, again, like that capability, want it, and we can actually pay their claim much quicker when we uh, have them send in virtual pictures and inspections. Uh, we've continued to invest in technology to ensure agents are successful, whether it's from a servicing standpoint with agency dashboard alerts, whether it's through APIs or other connections to help you with real-time quoting of uh, the business. We continue to make those investments because we've heard loud and clear. Bill's talked to you about telematics. Again, we're really excited about our results there, and that comes from all the efforts. I, I think as Bill said, you know, we know all you have to do is ask because 50% of the consumers out there today are more than willing to take on any type of telematics uh, measurements. And we continue to invest in education for our agents, whether it's through learning about the industry, whether it's about having specialty speakers. We want to make sure that you have all the information you need. And then lastly, I'd hit on in the far left-hand corner at the bottom is the premium compare tool. We know that this is going to be a tough year in 2022 and probably going into 2023 as well. And the more we can help you educate consumers, explain why premiums are going up to Bill's uh, comment earlier, we want to help you resell why they chose your agency and why you chose Travelers to be the company. We know that that's probably one of the most important things that you're having to do right now is ex explain those premium increases. And we want to make sure you have the tools to do that so that you can retain the business and continue to grow as premiums go up in the environment we're in. So with that, I'll pause and turn it back to you, Joan.
Okay, terrific, Laurie. That was just great. The overview, um, you know, just you touched on so many different things, both Bill and Laurie. So, but I want to talk about something about the customer. I've heard you both say we need to serve customers how they want to be served. And we all talk about Amazon and our last experience of Amazon. So what does it actually mean for travelers? What are, you, what are we talking about in the insurance industry, having the customers tell us how they want to be served and how can agents keep a pulse on that? Great. Well, let me, uh, let me take the first part of that. You know, I, we think it starts absolutely with asking the customer, right? We have market research capabilities. We have partners with that. We have study groups. So it's about starting with asking and then really listening to the responses. And to us, this means engaging with customers when you get started with an idea, as you're testing concepts, as you're understanding the usability of what you're developing. And of course, once you get it into market, really having an ability to understand the customer experience, the net promoter score, and have that feedback in your solution. So this, you know, this idea extends into where we offer our products from a distribution standpoint, how our products are designed, and of course, how we support our customers in terms of interaction with our products over time. So tangibly, you know, it manifests in examples like telematics, which I had shared. It manifests in how we provide uh, an ability to engage with us from a service perspective, mobile apps, mobile websites, voice chats, or providing options for customers. And, and of course, also, you know, allowing customers to self-service like uh, the self-inspections that we have talked about when they want to. Um, but with that, let me hand it over to Lori to talk about how agents can really keep a pulse. Yeah, I, th I think, Bill, it's, there's going to be a lot of overlap, right, between consumers and agencies. And I think we all have to put the customer at the center of everything we do. It really starts with what the customer wants, the consumer. And, you know, it's, it's what we just talked about. We have to be available to service them 24 by 7. We have to bring them the digital capabilities they're looking for, you know, whether it's digital self-service wager, whether it's texting, we know consumers want that, whether it's you have a dynamic website that they can interact with you on anytime they want. And quite frankly, just leveraging your trusted advisor status. Yeah, you know, I think that's a huge advantage for the independent agency channel is all these digital capabilities still bring the customer to you when they have those difficult questions. So Joan, I think we're, we're looking at it pretty similar between the consumer and the agency side. So, so Bill, just a quick follow up on that, uh, and I've never done it, but are people actually taking pictures of say a tree fell on their roof or on their fence? Do you see a market uptick in people submitting their own photographs to file a claim? Yeah, we really have. Um, you know, it, it's a great capability for, for customers and especially um, as we moved into the pandemic, we did see increased adoption now. Fortunately, I think our organization had the foresight to understand that that was a really important capability from a customer standpoint. And then as a pandemic hit, it really accentuated the interest. And, you know, I'd say similarly on the self-inspection side, when you're purchasing a policy for us, you know, we, we continue to see uh, improvement in adoption from a consumer standpoint. And, um, you know, there's a willingness there and we're continuing to figure out how to dial into that. Yeah, and I think the app from the app store rating, I know ratings can vary and lots of different factors, but your rating, you mentioned it on the app store was what for, for the Travelers app? For the IntelliDrive app, it's 4.5. And I think for our self-service app, it's even higher. I don't know. Yeah, 4.7, Bill. Thank you. Yep. That, that's really remarkable, actually, because, <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people are very unhappy with their insurance company. So anything above four, I would think, is uh, is terrific. So congrats on that. Um, okay, I want to get back to Lori. You talked a lot about growing market share for our independent uh, channel, independent insurance uh, agents channel. So you attribute a lot of that to growth in homeowners. What about auto and how are we ensuring or helping agents get that auto uh, book as well as homeowners? Yeah, no, you're right on, Joan. We've, we've certainly seen, uh, quite honestly, homeowners rates increase so much, like Bill talked about, that they're now about the same as automobile premium. So I think naturally agents have kind of move towards leading with uh, the homeowner's quote. And I, I do believe in parts of the country, there's a lot fewer carriers in the homeowner's marketplace, which uh, makes them kind of leave with the home and then try to get the auto. But we've really worked hard on helping agencies see the benefit of total account solutions, as Bill mentioned earlier. If they get that home, go after the auto, go after the additional lines. Uh, we put credits in place for the more policies you write with us, the more credits you get. 
Uh, we know it insulates, insulates us from a retention standpoint. And as I showed that market share, as the captives, you know, or excuse me, as the direct market, to, direct to consumer marketplace picks up auto, we have to make sure we're insulating ourselves. So if we grab that home, we got to bring that auto in. And quite honestly, we think we put technology in place that really makes that much easier than it's ever been. We really like how our systems are integrated so that you write the home or you start with the auto and you get the home and then you insulate yourselves with each additional line of business. So um, probably the best way to get the, the auto is to quote with all discounts. You know, Bill talked a lot about IntelliDrive. That's really kind of our ace in the hole for the independent agency channel to be able to compete and have a competitive price. And then you bring it in and get all those discounts. Uh, we really think that that's kind of the secret to success right now. Great. Well, you talked about the telematics. Let's dig a little deeper. We have to acknowledge that April is Distracted Driving Awareness Month. And as many of you know on the, on the line here, we launched a program called Every Second Matters, really to raise awareness uh, at the Travelers Institute uh, about uh, the, the dangers of distracted driving. And, and Bill, I know you worked hard on um, kind of the risk index that we put out every single year. It's the number one top issue on people's minds. In 2021, the statistics were very sad for us. We had 42,000 souls lost on our, on our roads. And that's when miles driven was actually down in a pandemic year. So tell us what you're seeing in your data uh, with telematics and, and you know, what other interventions can you, can you talk about adding the distraction to the app uh, that you did a few years back? What are you seeing in the data and, and how can we just turn this around um, and save more lives? Yeah, it, it, it's a it's a really important issue, right? And not just a business issue. And you know, to your point, that um, risk index, the 2021 Travelers Risk Index uh, survey had some, I think, some startling data points. You know, in addition to what what you had called out, you know, post pandemic, we are seeing drivers uh, being much more distracted than they were in the past. 26% of folks on the road uh, admit to texting or emailing while being on the road. 20% checking social media. 17% shopping online while on the road. So pretty shocking numbers. And so, you know, not surprisingly, you know, we, we felt very compelled to add that fifth variable of distraction to our new IntelliJive program. And if you step back and you look at the industry, you see that same tack being taken by a lot of competitors. So it, it, it is an issue. Um, I would say without going through the details, we, we have data on it and it tells us it's an issue. There recently was a, uh, a distracted driving report published by really one of the major providers of telematics solutions, Cambridge Mobile Telematics. And uh, they found that February of 2022 was the worst month for phone distractions since 2019. It was up almost 30% relative year over year. So I think it's pretty clear that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, you know, what do we do about it? You know, we obviously, we like the adoption of IntelliDrive. We think it provides us a really good surface area with customers to influence. Uh, we provide a score, which I, you know, for me is motivating, right? I want to score better. That's one aspect. We also attempt to influence behavior with things like gamification. So think about it as a distraction-free streak. Of course, there's educational materials, there's driving tips, and a lot of that is targeted around distraction. Um, but obviously, uh, to your point, you know, the programmatic work around every second matters is really valuable beyond travelers, customers, and, and really for society at large. Um, we absolutely think education, awareness is part of the solution. You know, I'd, I'd say part of the solution is, is financial incentives. You know, when you look at the telematics programs that insurance carriers offer, there are discounts for better driving behavior, inclusive of distraction. Um, there also are, right, outside of insurance, there are penalties for tickets. In Connecticut, I can't drive up 84 without seeing a sign that says, you drive, you text, you pay. And, and I think that's really important. Lastly, um, I would say there's an onus um, on you know, companies that are designing technology in cars and in devices to really think about how do they provide capability, but at the same time, uh, don't uh, accidentally promote or increase distraction while driving. So um, you know, I'll end with you know, distracting driving. You, you really, it can't be a culturally accepted behavior. Uh, we have to say something, we have to take control, we have to silence our phone, right, put it on do not disturb. So, you know, like many things, I'd say there's not one answer, but I think there's many levers and it's pretty clear evidence out there that it says it's an, it's an issue that needs to be addressed. 
Yeah, and I, I think what I, what I love about our program is we really talk about modeling the behavior. And so for any of you listening in today, if you have employees and employees are out there on the road driving and you know they're driving, don't call them. Don't call them when you know they're driving, right? And if you're the employee, you see your boss calling, don't answer. And have that conversation with your teams in your offices to say, look, I'm not going to call you while you're driving and you should not answer while you're driving. If there's some emergency, obviously pull over. You have the Do Not Disturb app on all of our cell phones now. Please activate that. Um, and we have lots of instructions on our website, travelersinstitute.org, uh, to help you talk to your employees and others uh, about that. Okay, Lori, back to you. Um, so we have a question coming in from the audience here. And I really like this question because he says, I'm a younger person in an agency that's been established and around for 50 years, run by a terrific family. I am the young person trying to change and digitize our offices. And I'm wondering about your future ready. You always talk about making agencies future ready. So if you had one recommendation or some advice for this young person trying to kind of help, uh, help the agency move into the next um, digital phase of their own uh, evolution, uh, what would be that one thing or two things, Lori, that you can help this younger person talk about being future ready uh, in his agency. Okay, since you gave me a little leeway there with maybe more than one suggestion, um, I'm going to take advantage of that. I mean, I think the first thing really starts with doing an assessment of where you stand today. It's hard to, if you don't have a baseline of where you are today, it's hard to know where you need to get. Um, so I think understanding what capabilities exist today. And then if I had to truly pick one thing that I'd invest in, um, you know, I think about what's going on in the industry. You know, the direct-to-consumer carriers are out there, you know, 1-800 or website capabilities. And when consumers go there, they get that quick quote right back. It's usually texted to them. So I, I love what we're doing, and I'm sure other carriers are going to invest in it as well. But digital quote proposals that can be texted. We, I just showed you the data. Consumers want to be communicated through through text, and they want everything instantaneous. So I would say uh, after you do the assessment and you figure out where you stand, I'd start investing in texting capabilities in the agency, realizing a lot of agency owners don't want folks to use their personal phones and people don't want to use their personal phones. There's vendors out there like Podium that have those texting capabilities that will work throughout the agency. And that way you can start that, that quick texting of a digital quote proposal. You're meeting what the consumer needs and you're doing it the way they wanna do it. So that's probably where I'd start. Okay, terrific, thank you, Lori. All right, I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about one of the number one issue on everyone's mind, which is attracting and retaining talent. So we've heard about this great resignation during the pandemic and people are reevaluating their lives. So both to you, Bill first, how do you talk about a new, uh, to a new graduate uh, about coming to the insurance industry and, and talking about all the different facets of insurance um, and getting those people in and then keeping them, keeping them engaged? How do you do it in your business, Bill? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and talent is so top of mind these days. You know, I'll, I'll start like personally in my career. Uh, I was a consultant at the beginning, so I had a chance to actually experience a couple of different industries, high tech natural resources, medical technology, financial ser services. And I intentionally went into insurance about 20 years ago. And honestly, I'm still hooked, right? It still has a new car smell to me. When, when I think about, you know, why, why is it still exciting to me? Uh, the first thing I think about is a human element. It's just so foundational to the industry, right? The relationships that Lori and her team and everyone has from an agent, a broker standpoint, customers, working with cross-functional teams. You know, when you're able to see how an insurance company, your company, is there for individuals and families at their most critical time of need, you understand why we do what we do. You know, and second, I'm, I'm enamored <laughs> and constantly challenged by the complexity of the marketplace. And quite honestly, regulatory, compliance, evolving business models, it's exciting. You can see it with a lot of the money that's flowing into the, into the insurance industry. And then finally, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I love technology. I love data. There's vast reservoirs of that. And so you're constantly challenged with how do you harness the power of that data to deliver a better experience and better product to our customers? So uh, I get really excited about it. To me, you know, there's meaning in my work. There's, there's always a challenge. It could stretch you in many different ways, people, strategy, technology, data. I've just never gotten bored. And I, I really 
don't expect that I ever will. So uh, for those of you, if, if that sounds interesting, come join us in the insurance industry. All right, Lori, same question to you. What are you doing? What are you telling agents? Because agencies are all uh, facing this issue as well, and they're all competing for this talent. So what are we doing in Travelers to help agencies with talent management? Yeah, no, that's probably the number one question I get to Bill's point and to, to your question today is, how can we uh, how can we learn from you? What's working for you? You know, I'll, maybe I'll just hit on three really quick things. I, I'd say flexibility, diversity and inclusion, and recognition of work. So from a flexibility standpoint, I think a lot of us learned how differently we can operate in a post-COVID environment. And most folks have moved to hybrid environments. We've, we've done very similarly where we require so many days in the office and then so many days of work from home. But I think, I think talent is looking for that flexibility. Uh, so that's one thing that we've spent a lot of time on, on the diversity and inclusion end. I grew up on the agency side. So I was in an agency in Topeka, Kansas with my dad. And one of the first things he encouraged me to do was to become a member of the Big I. And I spent a lot of time with the Invest program. And I think, uh, you know, recognizing all those different opportunities out there for uh, people to learn about the insurance industry is really, really important. To Bill's point, I, I don't think most people grow up wanting to get into the insurance industry, but we have everything to offer that any corporation does from finance to sales to product development to human resources. You know, you can go across the gamut and the industry offers all of that. You know, I'm a big proponent of diversity networks and that's something Traveler spends a lot of time thinking about, you know, it's, it's just an imperative for us from a business standpoint. And one of the things we developed at Travelers, as you well know, Joan, is the She Travels program. I'm part of the Women's Diversity Network and part of the folks that help lead the, the She Travels, where we've really helped women, you know, not only invest in themselves, but in their business by talking to other women, having mentors, being able to have conversations about challenges in their business. We've got a really cool LinkedIn program where you can join and communicate back and forth that way. So um, again, regardless of uh, um, what type of network it is, I, I think it's really important to, to find individuals across any industry that you can give them more and more information about the insurance business. And then I'll just, I'll end with recognition. I think employees today want to be recognized for their work. You know, I, I lead a sales organization. So for me, that's a, that's a daily thing. You know, when we have a, a great, uh, great week of sales, we're, you know, we're talking about it. We're, we're, we're slapping each other on the back. We're high-fiving. Uh, we have a lot of fun with recognition. So I think that's what folks are looking for. It's a tough environment out there, regardless with everything we've been through with COVID, regardless of the industry. And I just think recognition is really, really key right now. Great. I couldn't agree with that more, Lori. So, um, all right, we're going to take your questions now. So please drop them in the Q&A if you have any. So first one comes from Lori Hans, Hans Insurance. Uh, probably to you, Bill. Uh, how does the future look with more auto manufacturers covering their car insurance themselves, usually combining those with leases? How are we thinking about that? Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great question. And, and I, I think you see many examples across industries where companies are really looking to build on their core revenue stream and move into to what you call adjacency. So I think, you know, to some extent, it's a pretty natural extension for some of the car manufacturers like GM, like Tesla, like Ford, uh, to move into insurance. If you remember, GM had, uh, you know, GMAC, which was invested years ago. Um, but what I think is different today is that cars are basically computers, right? Getting back to that one out of every three cars, right? Supports telematics. And those computers are capturing a lot of information, obviously, is valuable to uh, developing an insurance product. And so I think that's what we know, right? Uh, the manufacturers are looking at how can that power a new offering, a new adjacency. Um, you know, what we're seeing is they're developing those offerings. They're also providing that information to other carriers, provided, of course, there's a customer agreement. So these are not really exclusive offerings. And, and quite honestly, I don't, I don't ever expect them to become sort of exclusive environments. Um, just because when you, when you think about sort of, uh, you know, the nature of insurance, you're never gonna really be able to uh, have the placement levels that you need to have sort of exclusivity as a manufacturer. So, um, you know, when you think about it, right, running, writing one policy for one driver on a purchase vehicle, it's relatively easy in the grand scheme, but what it's really about is providing protection for a household of drivers, vehicles, 
Um, and that gets a little more attenuated, a little harder from that purchase. Plus we know uh, there's real value to providing protection for a customer holistically, right? Property, umbrella, personal items, boat, yacht, et cetera. And that would take manufacturers a bit farther. So, you know, we're, we're not surprised to see these examples of manufacturers looking at insurance offerings. We'll always like everything, you know, seek to understand those models. If there's a mutually beneficial opportunity, of course, we'll look at it, we're a business. Um, but our focus is really on our connected car strategy from an auto standpoint and uh, you know, ensuring that we have the right products to support our customers overall. Yeah, and this is a tough business, right, Bill? You have to have decades of experience in underwriting and, and the claim, just having the whole claim operation stood up um, to service these policies, that doesn't happen overnight, I assume, right? Absolutely, no, I think that's, that's an excellent point. And we've seen some of that when you look at some of the, um, the insure techs coming in. It is, a, it is maybe a harder business uh, to run than it looks like from the outside. And your point around, uh, you know, underwriting and pricing experience is really paramount. And of course, that service from a claim standpoint, it's not something you can initiate um, very easily. Actually, you went to it. So let's go with another audience question on insure tax. Um, and it, it, this person asks, you know, what is the future of insure tax? All the hype, the IPOs, the run up in the stock, and then the run down the stock. And they're finding it harder to run this business than that maybe some of the private equity folks who invested in them thought. So what are your thoughts on insure tax? Bill, why don't you start? And if Laura, you have anything to add, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I touched on it a little bit. I, you know, uh, we, we take everything serious uh, from a competitor standpoint. We think there's always something to learn. And when insure tax uh, came out, what we were really interested in is uh, how they employed technology, how they delivered experiences that were intriguing to customers. Because there's, there's traction, right? If you look at a couple of those insure techs, they have relatively significant volumes of customers and premium. And so we really tried to focus on that. What we were very interested in was over time, how were they able to match risk with price? And um, I would say a couple of examples, we, we saw uh, you know, a finite set of questions. And, and we wondered over time with that change. And we absolutely saw that. We saw, um, the question set expanding as they were trying to better match that price with risk, uh, started to ask questions about roofs where they didn't on property. We think that's pretty fundamental. And so, um, you know, I, I think they're going through a lot of growing pains. You know, again, we'll continue um, to look for inspiration and, and look for examples of things that we can do better from an insure tech standpoint. But we feel really confident about the business model that we have, the products we're developing, um, you know, the distribution network that we have. And uh, you know we can compete with sort of the quote unquote traditional carriers as well as our uh, our, our insure tech competitors as well. Okay. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, Joan, is I, I think insure techs have challenged all of us to be uh, much simpler in how we do business and make it easier. And I think they learned along the way that expertise is king. And you know, quite frankly, we've partnered with some insure techs to make sure that. Uh, we help them not only from an expertise standpoint, but from a distribution standpoint, like we talked about earlier. So it's, it's actually, I think it's been a, a good challenge on both ends. Great, okay, Lori, this question is probably for you from Kristen LaPlante. She asked, will self-inspections and or self-endorsements be accessible to the independent agent to be sure any self-service was done correctly? I like to stay informed and involved with our insurance policies, which is a perk of having an independent agent. So this is a good question, Bill, right? And Lori, as our technology evolves, we're taking our own pictures. How do you know that I took that picture correctly, right? And what, how does the interface with the agent happen when we're doing more self-service um, activities are, if for customers? Yeah, maybe I'll start, Bill, and you can, uh, can bring us home on this one. Um, so one of the things we just uh, put out into the marketplace is called For Agents Dashboard. And it really does give our agents it, more real-time notification of business they're servicing. So think about any types of requests they may have sent into our underwriters, our PI service. Um, we can let that, instead of them having to pick up the phone and call, we can now show them where we are on the request. Maybe it's reports on something they're wanting to find out. And frankly, a lot of it's just alerts as to what's going on in their book of business. So I think that's one of the things we're working harder and harder to make sure that we have those capabilities. We continue to build those in from a claim standpoint as well, so that we can alert them with different types of claim notifications as well. Bill, I don't know if you have something you'd add to that. 
I, I think you covered it great. You know, I, we believe in uh, in transparency and in, in the service of our mutual customers. And you know, uh, I think a lot of uh, you know longstanding insurance carriers will say, you know, we had to get the infrastructure, we had to get the data in place, right, so that what we see and how we interact with our customers can be available to our agent partners. And that's absolutely an investment we've been making to Lori's point. Uh, and sort of that foundation that we've been building over time. Okay, uh, another timely question here. It's kind of two part. Um, I understand inflation and the conflict in Ukraine is driving supply chains and prices higher and higher and higher, but customers just want lower prices. Are we seeing any increase in customers being more interested in what is influ influencing the cost of their personal insurance products? I mean, is it hard to explain um, why rates are going up in these different states, or uh, how, how would you help an agent explain it, I guess is the question. All right, maybe I'll start, Bill, and let you follow up again. Um, so we're taking that really seriously right now. You know, we're an organization that's trying to grow our top line and continue to do it very profitably. So we've spent probably the last six months of the year anticipating what's going on in the marketplace, everything Bill talked about earlier. And we're really working on the education side, making sure that our agents have the information they need to explain what's going on and why that is causing rate increases. So that's been a huge part of it. We, we continue to educate around how you can make the price more competitive. So whether that's like we've talked about in Teledry, that makes us very competitive in the marketplace, whether it's writing more pieces of business to get those multi-policy discounts. Uh, we've got a new... Uh, actually tool that we just took out to our agents about 30 days ago where, uh, that I mentioned, uh, one of the investments we're making for the future is premium compare tools so that people understand why their premium went up. I can't tell you how many times they just assume it's all right when if you step back and look at changes they may have made to the policy, whether it's taking off one car and adding another, whether they had a new driver in the household. Um, customers forget those kinds of things. And I think having that availability right then and there for the agent to explain why the rate did go up. Again, in conjunction with what we're seeing in the environment, um, we're really trying to spend a lot of time on, you know, reselling them on why they are with that agency and with travelers. So Bill, I'll let you add on to that. Boy, uh, you, you covered it great, right? And, uh, you know, probably the only thing I'd add is, you know, um, that, that was specifically something we thought about with our, our recent product development, Quantum Home 2.0. You know, we wanted to build in flexibility for customers to select the right coverage for them, as opposed to in the past, it might have been a little bit more sort of structured and contained. And so, you know, we, we give customers uh, those options. To Lori's point, we continue to focus on finding uh, the opportunity to provide discounts and, and, you know, to the point around be it telematics, uh, take up rate or digital auto discount. We are seeing customers uh, increasingly adopt that. And I believe partly that is to try to take control, right, of the price point. Terrific. Well, listen, this hour just flew by, and I want to thank you so very much to both of you for your time, your expertise, for sharing it uh, with all of our viewers. And uh, I'd like to invite you back, of course, to talk about the evolving marketplace as we, as we see it, and hopefully getting inflation under control and getting uh, more employees in our industry, attracting that diverse talent that we so desperately need and want in our industry. So thank you for doing all you're doing for our agents and our employees. Um, and uh, let's keep working on distracted driving because I know we can make a, a, a big uh, dent in that and help people uh, to, to work on it. So uh, also speaking of thanks, so thank you, Bill and Lori for being here today. And I also wanna thank someone very, very special on the Travelers Institute team, my longtime colleague and friend, and there she is with me yesterday and with her little face on uh, some cupcakes, we held a little going away party for Katie Riley. She's been at the Institute for eight years. She helped us shape the Institute over the last eight. Uh, she's helped dedicated uh, a lot of her uh, precious time. She's a mother of three. She's a marathon runner, just got her a master's degree um, in public policy. And we're just so grateful to have her on this team. I am just uh, personally uh, thankful for you, Katie, uh, to making me a better person uh, running the Institute and for all you've done, mostly behind the scenes, folks. A lot of people give us credit but it's people like Katie who makes this all happen. So it's your last day today, uh, stepping back to be with the family and we're just so proud of you. So uh, join me in thanking Katie. You'll be sorely missed and we wish you all the best, my friend. 
Um, now let's talk about the upcoming programs on April 13th. Uh, we want to level up your LinkedIn presence. This is a impactful, powerful way. Uh, just in one hour, you're going to figure out how to change your LinkedIn profile. So it really is a selling profile in your business. And then April 20th, we'll talk about fighting insurance crime. We have some experts um, there. Uh, and then May 4th, I'm hosting the former U.S. Surgeon General Jerome Adams on lessons learned from the front lines of the pandemic. He was the Surgeon General when the pandemic hit uh, the world. And so we'll hear from him. You could register for any of these programs at travelersinstitute.org. I invite you to connect with me directly. There's my LinkedIn. And if you haven't already, please take a minute to fill out our survey. We're very interested to hear your thoughts and who else uh, you might wanna see on our programs and what other topics you want us to tackle. So again, thank you to our speakers today. Uh, farewell, Katie, we're gonna miss you. Um, and uh, thanks to you all for uh, joining our Wednesday sessions.